Okay. Um, yeah, again, uh, my name oh. is Mike Swartout. I'm a professor of aerospace and mechanical engineering at St. Louis University, and uh, I am involved with our student built spacecraft programs and teach courses primarily in our space area. And as, as noted here in my opening chart, um, I'm the difficult one. I, I don't want to be the curmudgeon that says, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. I, I'll phrase it instead of here are the challenges associated with trying to do anything in space, especially related to uh, keeping people alive. And so in the limited time I've got, I really want to distill it down to three basic ideas. Uh, energy, distance, which turns into time, and then also environment. And so in terms of the categories of things to think about or what are, what's going to make this difficult, what's going to make this uh, hard to happen, uh, these are the factors. So first, energy. And I'm actually going to cheat. I'm going to talk about two different things within energy. One is the energy necessary to get into orbit. So if we're starting on the surface of the Earth, uh, getting to orbit is only uh, about 10% of the energy is altitude. The rest of it is speed. And so while it is impressive to send rockets straight up and get high altitude, uh, they are still an order of magnitude away from getting into orbit. And so just rough orders of magnitude. If you're standing on the surface of the Earth and you want to be in Earth orbit, it's on the order of 25,000 miles per hour that you need to speed up. If we're trying to go from the Earth to Mars, it's on the order of 35,000 miles per hour. And in short, the laws of physics and especially objects don't like to be accelerated from zero to 25,000 miles per hour, and they'll do everything in their power to stop that from happening. So the, the launch process is a, is a tremendous challenge just to get anything up and certainly to get things of the size and scope that we would talk about in terms of uh, providing food for space flight. Um, you also have to bring your power with you. So you can think of solar power, you're getting on the order of 500 watts per square meter of electricity, which sounds like a lot, but really isn't. Uh, if we're trying to get to megawatts, uh, those are very, very large systems indeed. The other problem is that sunlight drops off as you get further from the sun. You can think of it, it, it spreads out and it weakens. And so you only get 40% of that energy at Mars and 4% at Jupiter. So often when we're trying to do higher powers at further distances, we move to nuclear. Uh, you don't have the, the availability issues, but obviously it's heavy and of course it's nuclear. And so that brings its own challenges. So as I said, kilowatts, yes, we can do that. Megawatts, only in certain circumstances. So understanding our power constraints becomes again part of the challenge. So that's energy. To distance, this is roughly to scale. Uh, what you're seeing in terms of the distance from the Earth to the Moon uh, and the relative size of the Earth and the Moon. Um, this is mainly to point out how much empty space there is uh, between objects and how much time it takes to get between things. And, and the other one in terms of perspective Again, this is roughly to scale. Uh, that orange belt is the primary location of just about everything that we've ever flown is in that orange circle, the geostationary orbit. Um, and in fact, that green circle, with the exception of the very few people that have gone to the moon, uh, everything else where we've sent people so far has been within that green circle. Uh, so just in terms of we haven't done much beyond very close to the surface of the Earth. Um, and now this is, again, uh, the, the orbits are roughly to scale. The planets are not at all to scale. If I, if I drew the planets to scale, you, you wouldn't see them. They'd be little dots. And some of that is to point out is that this giant empty space doesn't even show up on this chart. It's so small compared to the relative distances. And so when we're thinking of leaving Earth orbit, mainly what we're looking for is Mars, possibly Venus. Um, and those are because of those are our, our nearest neighbors. But again, just get the sense of scales and distances. I'm trying out this analogy. I'll be honest, this is the first time that I've, I've uh, put it on an audience. So we'll see how well it works. But I, I find it useful when we're thinking about distances, also thinking about the logistics involved in it, especially it, you know, human brains. We like to have analogies. We like to compare you know, one challenge to another. And so we think, oh, we've gone to the moon. We've gone to Mars. In terms of sending robots, sending people shouldn't be that much more difficult. And, and so I think of it this way, swimming in terms of distances and scales and also preparation that would be necessary. And so I would think of a rocket that goes up and comes down, think of it as, a sub, as an Olympic 1500 meter freestyle. Uh, it can be done. And certainly there are people who are good at it. And, and with work and training and effort, uh, you could swim the 1500 mile 
1500 meter freestyle, excuse me. If you want to go into Earth orbit, think of that more as the scope of an Ironman triathlon. So first, you're going to do all this work and effort to make yourself exhausted, and then you're going to swim. So then going to the moon would be more like swimming the English Channel, but round trip, swimming there and back. And now you can imagine the preparation, the challenges, the risks involved. They're going up dramatically. And so, again, only a few people have managed to do it. Um, it is not something that you could just jump into and, and uh, pull off. And the way that I think of it is, if you think of this sort of stacking analogy, then sending people to Mars would be equivalent of swimming from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Now you're dealing with completely different sets of logistics in terms of weather, in terms of distance, in terms of resting, all these things that you didn't have to do with the other ones, you would now have to account for because we're going from 25, 26 miles to several thousand miles in terms of just the effort involved with that. And so again, unfortunately I'm the difficult one, but I think it's helpful to be realistic about the kinds of challenges that are going to pose to us, and especially the step order and challenges as we get from one place to another. Um, again, one of the, I actually say I like a lot about that movie, The Martian, that came out a few years ago, especially emphasizing how you had to make use of the resources and the capabilities with you, that being able, there, there was no easy rescue. And again, if you, I'm sure many of us have watched Apollo 13 and other things like that, where the time you had to wait or the the distance involved where rescue was possible um, even if it were difficult so the last one i'm going to talk just very briefly because i think the rest of the panelists have a much better handle on this than i do with respect to the the space environment or especially the environment for uh, for food so i'm just going to to emphasize we've got closed systems and again uh, our other panelists have already been talking about that uh, it can be both very hot and very cold uh, if you're in sunlight, as I saw, you get very warm, uh, but if it's an eclipse or in other places, it can get very cold indeed. And so we have all of the, the challenges of doing both, sometimes simultaneously. Then there's radiation effects um, and the, the challenge that the Earth's magnetic field provides a nice, pretty good shelter for us from the effects of radiation, which is something, again, in terms of shielding or in terms of what it's going to do to our, to our food is something that we'd have to be aware of. Again, as I said, I, I'm mainly here to, to talk about the challenges, and certainly I'm hoping that as we have conversation here, we can, if not now, start dreaming up ways to overcome them. But with that, I will, uh, I'll get off the stage and, and make room for others. I just want to close with two thoughts. We're probably very familiar, um, and I have to make the shameless plug. Uh, Gene Kranz, the uh, flight director for Apollo 13, uh, is an alum of our program. I, I can't claim any responsibility for it, but uh, he is he's a graduate of our of our engineering program. Uh, but unfortunately, it has been updated. Um, and in fact, this is a paraphrase of Rob Manning, who was the chief engineer for the Mars Curiosity and, and continues in many roles at JPL now. In space exploration, failure is not only an option, but it is the default outcome. And so we have to work hard to move ourselves to success. Again, with that, thank you for your time and attention. And I'm looking forward to the conversation.